We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal and born with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But all too often, that truth is forgotten. All too often, those rights are ignored as all too many stand in silence and all too many suffer alone. So our work goes on until the land of the free is free of racism, until the home of the brave is brave enough to change, until by the people and for the people means doing right by all the people, until justice just is. Well, hello, I'm Margaret Mitchell, and I am president and CEO of the YWCA, and it is great to be here today. And joining me is Elizabeth Emery. And I have known Elizabeth for a number of years, and so it's really great to uh, have you with me today, Elizabeth. Welcome. Well, th thank you so much. You know, you and all the work that you do at the Y is always such an inspiration to me and the way you speak up about equity and justice. Just so thank you for inviting me. Well, you're no slouch yourself and uh, you're used to really being on the other side. You're used to being the uh, interviewer um, and not the interviewee. So this is, this is uh, fun and we'll talk a little bit about that. But you are an athlete. You have competed at the highest levels of uh, professional uh, athletic dumb, and you um, you are also an artist, um, and you are also an advocate um, through uh, your podcast. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, your time as an athlete as we start out, uh, because today we're going to be talking about sports, and we're going to be talking about sports through the lens of uh, women in sports and uh, individuals who identify as female in sports. And so um, you've won a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you're, you're a cyclist. Um, and I don't mean uh, uh, your indoor Peloton bike. <laughs> you are, you've been a part of the, the, the real time Peloton. Um, you won national championships. You won a gold medal at the Pan American Games. You've won, you've won, you've won. You've been part of the tour. Um, what is it? What is it like? Um, you know, being a professional athlete. What was it like uh, to be a female uh, professional athlete? You know, what uh, what does sports mean for you personally? You know, as a as a child growing up. Were you aspiring to be a professional athlete? What did that look like? I mean, it's all kind of who were who were your role models? Were they were they male athletes as a profession uh, striving to be a professional athlete? Did gender come into it or or not at all? I know that's a lot, but that's a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, I feel just so lucky to have discovered cycling and to have been able to compete at that level and to, you know, like what a world to have been part of and to discover. And, you know, I just, I, I sort of am overwhelmed when I think about how I discovered it because as a kid, you know, looking back, I, yes, I was very active and I did a lot of different sports, but no, it never occurred to me that this was a job. And, you know, that's precisely why I do the podcast and talk about that because I'm from a generation you know, I'm sort of on the cusp of pre-Title IX, but definitely pre-Title IX. And there were not those opportunities. There was not the representation. You know, I think back, you know, what I thought sports for women was, was ice skating and gymnastics and, you know, soccer hadn't been popular at that time, you know, hadn't come up. And so to discover in my 20s that I could race, that I could be competitive at the highest level was just, you know, beyond a dream. Um, so, you know, now I, I feel like I'm able to take advantage of what I learned at that. I'm still very active. 
Um, I recently increased my training and I just love it. I, I love going out there and, you know, seeing what I can do and accomplishing a great workout. And, you know, especially as I get older, it's fun challenging myself both physically and mentally. And I think that's going to do me well as I age and, you know, I'll stay strong physically and mentally. And especially during COVID, you know, it was so great to have a routine and something that, you know, like I could check off my checklist, like, okay, I've done a good bike ride. I've done a good strength training workout. And so if I accomplished nothing else during that day, during COVID, at least I did that. You know, I think cycling has really come on um, over the last uh, 15 years. Um, certainly, you know, you know, Lance Armstrong and um, you know, U.S. Postal Service team has, you know, rose to prominence um, with the Tour de France and, and people begin to really understand spike, uh, cycling and the tour and um, certainly visibility came into play and uh, sponsorship came into play both for teams and individuals. And, um, but I think women's cycling was left behind. Totally. You know, women's cycling is one of the sports, or cycling is one of the sports that is completely ruled by white men. And they are fighting really hard not to diversify because why would you want to give up that power? And one thing that happened relatively recently is the cycling, the cyclist alliance was started by uh, ex pro racer, a couple ex pro racers. And it has the advantage that these racers no longer have anything to risk by speaking out. And they have made huge gains for the women's Peloton. And so it's really exciting to see that. And also some of the newer sports like cyclocross has, because it's, a, it's not newer, it's been around for a long time, but they've made real gains in both TV coverage and um, you know, the commentators are getting really good. They're learning about the sport and so they can talk about it in a really intelligent, exciting way. It's fascinating for me to watch a sport, um, uh, let's say cycling and, 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 and soccer. Um, you know, 50 years ago, obscure sports and the visibility has grown. Um, it, it just, it's just that the growth has been tremendous. And yet there, there seems to be this mystery when it comes to women's sports about how to increase visibility. It's like, what? I mean, I, I just, I, I'm just still baffled why uh, some of the bigger companies don't come in and support um, because, you know, we, we follow stories and then we follow the sport. We follow mm -hmm. stories and then we follow the sport. And it, I, I just don't understand that um, women's golf certainly has never gotten the traction. Um, it, it, there, it, it seemed like there was a while. Um, women's soccer has certainly um, grown tremendously. Uh, so the, the success, but the success and the visibility doesn't even met out for me. I don't get it. Well, I, it seems structural. It's oh, it's absolutely structural. And that is when I'm, I can't talk about it that articulately, but it's such a tangled web of how the money comes in and goes out. And I agree with you. I don't understand why more sponsors aren't jumping onto this. And in some ways, I think there's just a lack of understanding. You know, the top of the companies are me white men, and so they don't understand really what they're dealing with. And I can't tell you how many times producing the podcast, I've heard that old metaphor about a battleship is hard to turn. And I just think that's, I'm going to call it crap because we've seen really quick changes. You know, the Sedona Price video almost instantaneously created a, a much better gym. And to give an example in cycling, I'll, I'll mention cyclocross again. There was a cyclocross rider, she's British, and she was on the athlete advisory board of the International Cycling Federation. And she pushed and pushed for many, many years to get the women's top level elite race to run right before the men's top level elite race. 
her idea was, you know, if the women go right before the men, all the spectators will come and watch both races rather than having to decide whether to come on Saturday and Sunday or Sunday. And she also thought, you know, the TV system will be set up, the drones will already be out, and so the coverage will be there. And so, you know, finally there was this agreement that it would happen, which of course could have been done as soon as she brought it up, but it took years to get this going. And she was right. Wow, instantaneously, there were more spectators for the women's racing. There was more TV coverage. And because the TV coverage had already been set up, so the commentators who were doing the men also did the women, and they were forced to learn about the women's race, to learn about the women's riders, to learn about you know who had been good last year, the year before, blah, 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 so they could talk about it and sound intelligent. And they loved it, so they got really good. And of course, you know, viewer audience got better, and it's been a huge success. Yeah, it, it, it is just it is a constant. You know, you talk about the, uh, turning the battleship. It is a constant battle. You know, the the work that uh, Billie Jean King did, uh, you know, throughout the '70s um, has allowed you know Serena and Naomi. Um, to be among um, a very elite group of men uh, in terms of being the highest paid, you know, athletes. Um, but it's still stunning, you know, when you look at, you know, the WNBA versus the NBA and yeah. the, the athleticism in the WNBA, those women are incredible, uh, you know, no shoe deals, no, uh, you know, and you know, Sue Bird, I, we could just go on and on, on, and on. on. <laughs> Reiner, I mean, on and on and on, yeah. um, just incredible athletes and exciting game. And um, the league has continued to grow. Um, they've been powerful during um, this last year in terms of racial equity and really having a voice. I just, I'm just always stunned that the parody is not there. Yeah, I, I have no answer, <laughs> honestly. And that's the point of the whole podcast is, you know, I started the podcast in 2016 when I first heard that 4% stat, that only 4% of media coverage was about women athletes. And, you know, up until that point, I had been having discussion with friends and family, you know, like trying to you know, look at the subtleties of why in the world there would be this disparity and, you know, coming up with all the pat answers and that I've heard, you know, they're not as exciting and blah, blah, blah. And when I heard that 4% stat, I was like, 4% is zero. You know, yeah, I cannot yeah. talk about this anymore yeah. because this is racism. I mean, racism and sexism and it's systematic. This is what we're talking about. And yeah. until, you know, until we even get to, you know, let's get to 10% or 15%, then I can start talking about these subtleties. But until then, we just have to admit that it's systematic. So you started here, Her Sports, in 2016. It is a um, long format interview podcast. And I have to say that, um, how do you get that podcast voice? Like, I so, you know, I listened to the podcast um, which I really enjoy, by the way. And, and you, you have that podcast voice. Do you get training for that? How does that come? You know, just, it's so cool. Well, thank you. You know, I have to give kudos to my uncle who at one point said, you'd be great sportscaster. This was when I was racing and I sort of went, eh, I don't know. And I just, it always stuck in my mind. And so, no, I didn't have training, but I will tell you, I'm way better now than I was when I first started. You know, practice, practice, practice. And I would say that's one of the best things that I did, you know, when I first start out was I just started and said, yeah. you know, like, if it's bad, okay, well, you know, I got to try, I got to start it somehow. So people can find you, um, can find the podcast um, on, you're on every platform, every you know, platform. Apple and all yeah. the different, you know, podcast uh, formats. And then of course, people can go to hearhersports.com. Um, if they want to go there and stream uh, podcasts and look at all the cliff notes. Um, and then you have a, uh, people can call it in. You have, is the number like something, something badass? Yes. <laughs> you can leave me a message. Yes. Or find me on any social at, at Hear Her Sports. I love, love getting that. listener love comment. That. Yeah. 
two of my um, favorite podcasts. Um, you know, you did a podcast with uh, Commissioner uh, Jackie uh, McWilliams, who uh, spent a ton of time at the NCAA and then moved over to um, be the commissioner of the um, Central, the CIAA. Um, which, uh, and she graduated from uh, Hampton. She's the first female commissioner. That's, that's, I would have to check, <laughs> but it, it's that, yeah. One of the few, you know, yeah. in terms of one of the few top uh, women in leadership in sports, one of the few African-American at the, you know, top of her game. And, you know, the, um, the, the Central Intercollegiate, you know, Athletic Association, the CIAA, really started out as the colored, um, you know, uh, college association. Um, and it is comprised um, still to this day, mostly of historically black colleges. It was founded at Hampton, which is where my, I'm an alum of Hampton, as is uh, Commissioner McWilliams. And it was just an awesome podcast to hear um, her energy and enthusiasm. And then of course, you've interviewed Hall of Famer, um, Muffin McGraw, uh, the just retired, um, you know, women's basketball coach from Notre Dame. Who's been your favorite um, in terms of the, uh, the podcast? I'm gonna have to laugh at myself because my favorite is always the last one, <laughs> the mm -hmm. most recent one. I am, it just floors me how each of these women inspires me and motivates me. And, you know, I, that's one reason I really love podcasting because, you know, suddenly I feel like I'm part of a community of these women, even though they live far flung from me and, you know, we're not really friends. It's just, it feels, you know, it's so intimate. And uh, there's just so many lessons that I've learned personally. I feel, very, you know, I feel grateful that I've been able to talk, talk to them. I mean, Muffet certainly was, was, I mean, she's such an inspiration. And what I learned, you know, prepping to talk to her was how much work she's done to advance women in sports. I mean, one of the examples I talked about in the episode is that she knew very early on in her career before the team was as successful as it became that, you know, the audience numbers, the number of people that were watching the games was really important. And she put a huge effort, you know, it didn't happen miraculously overnight without any input. I mean, they had contests and this and that and stuff to get people in watching. And that was, that's so important that that stuff behind the scenes. It's huge. Um, of course, um, you know, much of McGraw uh, famously uh, sort of you know, went to school, I'll say, um, in, you know, a, again, a, a video that went viral, and we will get to Sedona Price, but, you know, she really, you know, she basically said, you know, enough is enough. Yeah. And yet, um, it almost felt, you know, looking back, it almost felt as if it was, uh, she's having a tantrum, and we'll wait for this to blow over. It didn't seem like there was a lot of action from the powers that be around, hey, it's time to, to change. And there was even some backlash in terms of, hey, we need to hire uh, women uh, for the women's game. That just seemed, I don't know, she got a lot of backlash. She for that. did. And, you know, it's so funny when you think about it, what she was saying was, you know, all basically all the men's team coaches are men. So why don't we have all the women's team coaches women? I mean, it's it, it's not this gigantic statement, you know. I think it's important for, you know, and, and this is another reason that I really admire her. You know, I think it's important for women to support other women and to do that even if it requires extra effort or, you know, sharing the spotlight. Yeah. So you've got these two podcasts going because you've got another podcast that is specifically focused in on Glenville. Talk a little bit about that and sort of what drove that. Um, I know a little bit behind uh, the scenes, but I'd love for you to share. Yeah. Uh, 
Here for Glanville was a sort of a unique uh, project with a limited time frame, and it's a set of audio documentaries. And you know, it's been one of the most significant projects that I've ever done. And you know, I thank you and the Y for recognizing that idea early on. So thank you for that. Uh, the aim of Hear Her Glenville was very similar to the podcast, but with a focus on a very specific neighborhood, Glenville in Cleveland. And I spoke to girls and women of all ages who either were from Glenville or lived there at the time and who were physically active in some way. You know, they certainly didn't have to be Olympians or, or um, aiming for Olympics, although there was one, there was a boxer who was aiming for that. Um, and, and a couple of recordings that have really stayed with me from that project were from the high school students in Coach Kreider's basketball program. And uh, Kyria, for example, was a sophomore at the time. And she said, you know, everywhere you go, you see NBA players their images and you don't never see the WNBA players. You know, like she said, you see LeBron's faces wherever, whatever restaurant you go to. And, you know, I think, you know, for me, it was the first time I had spoken to a young girl and see and saw that she noticed this stuff. You know, I think it's easy for us to pretend that girls don't notice it, are not impacted, are not hurt by it. When in fact they are, you know, here's a sophomore in high school talking about it in really passionate words. And, you know, she wasn't messing around, you know, basketball and being on this team with Coach Kreider had changed her life. You know, she became healthy. She started, you know, she had a team. She had a real role model with the Coach Kreider and she wanted to get a basketball scholarship to college. So this, this is important, important stuff. And then Chevelle, also a sophomore on the team, said that she liked basketball because she was aggressive and she could express that aggression while playing basketball. And I'm quoting here, she said, in class, she comes off a little wrong. And I have always wondered what that actually looked like. What is a little wrong? And you know, even in 2020, sport is one of the few places that girls and women can be aggressive. So again, you know, we pretend that sports is, you know, like, not that important, but it is. And it has severe consequences that are long-term. Like what's happening to her because she's a little wrong. Yeah, I, I, I love that. You know, the two A words that um, are, are often dangerous for women, aggression and ambition. And I think it's so important that, that sports really is an incredible outlet for both of those. Um, ambition and aggression, and uh, somehow it has been drilled in that this isn't, you know, um, you know, very it isn't feminine or women <clears throat> shouldn't aspire. Um, and I, I think that you know, sports is just hugely important in um, and is such a reflection of where we really are with equity for women that um, it really shows up um, sports is a perfect mirror um, and lets us really know how far we've got to go. Yeah, we still have such uh, specific visions of what women should look like. I mean, not just on the court, but off the court and what that, you know, how they should act, how they should play, how they should be with other people. And like you said, sports is such a great place for, that to come out, but also for women to practice how how they're gonna, you know, how they're gonna be aggressive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many so many different sports moments that you know, uh, the women's soccer team winning, you know, the first World Cup, and I can't remember the player's name who takes off her T-shirt. You know, she's wearing, uh, you know, really sort of a a tank sports bra. Um, which no one would identify as seeing her, you know, would describe as bear. And a huge firestorm. Oh. People, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, even Megan Rapino, when she did that gesture during the most recent World Cup, was criticized. Yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking of, you know, one of the last 
you know, sort of really important moments in female sports during the uh, women's uh, NCAA tournament, um, which is coming to Cleveland um, <laughs> yes. in, uh, yeah, it, is it? 2024. 20, 24? Yeah. yeah. Very excited about that. Um, we've got to do some work together on that. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, you know, I think you mentioned Sedona Price, who was the young woman who uh, said, look here, <laughs> here's what we have, here's what the guys have. Yeah. And it was, I guess I never, I was shocked because I thought the tournament, I thought the tournament was in a different place. That tournaments are, you know, a prep for a tournament is is always in motion, <laughs> and I I was just stunned. Were you? I I was stunned, but you know, my reaction mostly was, I am just so tired of mm -hmm. this. Like here we are again, and I'm, we may talk about this later, but you know, Title IX was passed forty nine years ago. Yeah, and there are very few schools who are Title IX compliant. And, you know, the thing with the, the gym at the tournaments was that it was such a public display of the NCAA's thought of what they needed to provide women. You know, they were not, this was not hidden anywhere. You know, this was, just, and, and of course, Sedona Price helped things, but, uh, you know, they were willing to put, that was what they thought we deserved. It's so, I, I, you know, they, the NCAA hands out um, fines for teams and individuals who break rules linked to all of their compliance, uh, linked to uh, a whole host of things, right? Um, I just really felt like, what is the reprimand? There, there needs to be a financial long-term commitment as a result of this um, breach. And I, I just, I didn't feel like the NCAA stepped in and sort of had a level of accountability. If I recall, it was Dick Sports, who the CEO is a woman, <laughs> right? Dick Sports with a female CEO who said, looky here. I, I mean, literally what the women had is what I have in my home gym. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It was embarrassing, but you know, it's, it's not just that, you know, like my personal reference is I I've been to the Mac tournament here in Cleveland, Ohio at the Q, what used to be the Q and it was equally embarrassing in some ways because, you know, all the women's games were at, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning on a weekday. And, you know, there were very few people in the stands, but how could there be, you know, who has the opportunity or the you know, position to go to an 11 o'clock game and then in addition, you know, none of the fancy food joints were open. So, you know, lunch was a pretzel. It's just, you know, we have to get over this. We have to make, you know, again, it's the battleship. This is not a battleship. You could decide tomorrow you wanted the fancy food stuff to be open at 11 o'clock in the morning for the women's games. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is absolutely, you know, stunning, absolutely stunning. I'm excited that Muffet McGraw is on the committee to look at the NCAA and, and follow through with that. I think, you know, I expect that something will be done given her, her position. I, I feel really hopeful about that and really excited um, that we are going to see, a, you know, a big shift. She has a big voice and she carries a big stick. And um, uh, so, it's, it, you know, it's wonderful uh, to be there. For her to be there, yeah, and I'm I'm not really sure about um, you know really the past year and um, you know just elements of sports and social justice. Um, you know we know that um, uh, athletes have always been engaged um, in social justice, and it's been really wonderful uh, to see their voice. What are your what are your sort of general, um, you know, thoughts and feelings around, um, you know, I mentioned the WNBA, 
Um, but even, you know, uh, Naomi Osaka um, in her, uh, you know, uh, her mask, uh, we carry the names of uh, individuals who've been murdered at the hands of police, um, you know, and really came out very powerfully um, in terms of her um, advocacy, her special justice, you know, advocacy. Yeah, I, it, it's exciting to see. And I, and I also love that women are sort of leading the charge in mm -hmm. that kind of speaking up. But, you know, I, I'd like to see everybody speak up about social justice and equity and race and gender. And, you know, not all of us have the platform that athletes do. So it makes it more important that they, they speak up like that. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I get, I guess that's where I am, you know, and, and I think also that, you know, again, we talked about the Sedona's video and, you know, that it did have impact, that speaking up actually does have consequences that make change and, you know, it can happen at every, any level, you know, it doesn't have to just be because you have 10,000 followers or whatever number of followers that they have. I love that Sedona just, you know, that she could see the inequities and say no more. Right. And, you know, so as she opens the video, uh, it's been a while since I've seen it, but as, as I recall, she opens the video, she's like, uh, just so you know, <laughs> this, is, this is how it was here. Yeah, uh, this is the difference, you know, and so it, it, it's just really, really uh, powerful. I, I want to talk briefly about um, just your thoughts on mental health and uh, Naomi Osaka's uh, position. I thought it was huge, hugely important, and I don't think we um, talk enough. Uh, there's certainly been some incredible breakthrough athletes. Um, before her that have talked about um, mental health. Um, but I think it's just so important. It, it's super important. And one of the things that I thought about a lot during the, when she decided not to show up for the press conference is that, because there was a lot of comparison, you know, there were a lot of people saying, oh, you know, like the men have to do it too. And I just, where I went was, you know, the, the, media coverage for female athletes is not good. And, you know, it just adds another level of stress to be dealing with, you know, you should smile, for example, that Simone Biles gets or, or, you know, why don't you smile more? I mean, that, that's, that's something a lot of female athletes feel. And so it's not just that she had to show up to this press conference and that's stressful, but it's this other layer that is on top of it. And, you know, I think journalists need to do a better job prepping and taking the athletes seriously. And yeah, great job Osaka for speaking up and, and making a stand. And, you know, you, you mentioned Billie Jean King. And one of the things that's always impressed me about what she did was that she did it while she was playing. And so there was huge risk and she lost you know, she lost money, she lost sponsors, all of that stuff. And the same thing with Naomi Osaka. I mean, she has the potential of losing something by speaking up this way. And that made it that much more powerful to me. Agreed. I absolutely agree. I agree. You know, there's always this, um, this interesting storyline that women's sports is not um, exciting. And if that is the reason, you know, that the, the big fish sort of are not, you know, drawn to the game. And, I, you know, I, I don't know. So anyway, <laughs> right? This is the common, this is one of the common threads. Yes. Well, you know, it's really interesting and it's absolutely true that that's a perception of women's sports. And, you know, I've referenced the 4% stat and that was discovered by Cheryl Cookie she has been doing with other colleagues a longitudinal study where every 10 years they look at media coverage. And so the 4% was discovered 30 years ago. And the most recent version of her study, the update came out just recently within the last several months. And we are at 4%. Wow. Wow, totally wow. And so, 
that is one you know, conclusion from her study is that we are seeing no change. But the other bit of the study is qualitative. You know, what is the coverage actually like? And one of the things that she found was that women's sports is covered in a very boring way. And I can't remember the words that she use, uses, but you know, commentators, when they talk about men's sports are exciting, they use exciting words, they use exciting tone, and, you know, it makes everybody exciting. Meanwhile, when they talk about women's sports, they sort of drone on and on. And I personally think a lot of this is they are not educated, they haven't been forced to do the research to know about what they're talking about. And so, you know, it is hard to sound excited when you don't know anything. And this always made sense to me, you know, intellectually, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I've been watching a lot of cycling and recently a women's race was on and the, co the commentator was so boring. I mean, I almost fell asleep and he didn't know anything. He didn't know what to say. It was just dreadful. And meanwhile, at the same exact time, the tour of Italy was going on, the men's tour of Italy. And you know, all the bells and whistles were out. They had comp terrific, super knowledgeable pro commentators, both men and women who knew what they were talking about. And it was just dynamic. And if you were a spectator who didn't know that much about cycling and you tuned into these two different things, you would obviously choose the men's version. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with what the racing is like. And this is sort of what I talk about uh, when, I, when I talk about the sort of this web that I've discovered doing the podcast is, you know, we can say that there's not good coverage of women's sports, but why is that? And it turns out into the, be this like big tangle of stuff of why it's not, that has to do with money, um, you know, systematic sexism that we talked about, you know, who has, who's at the top, you know, why aren't there more women, you know, running these things, sports media companies. And one of the things I've noticed in the last year or even maybe six months is that women who have made money in athletics as, as athletes are investing in sports media. You know, there's a new company Together X. I can't, I'm not exactly sure how you, you pronounce it, but I think it's Together X by a bunch of athletes. And it's a sports media company dedicated to women. And there are also athletes who are investing in new sports teams like the one in LA, the, the soccer team in LA. And I have great hope because of that, because ultimately it comes to the top. And if, if once we get women at the top of these companies, they will have a different perspective. And until not, until recently, you know, people putting money back into sports have all been men. So of course they're, you know, they're investing in things that they care about, which are, you know, important to them. And, you know, this, this started to occur to me when Kevin Love came out about his own mental health issues. You know, we were talking about mental health and he started a charity and he had a lot of money that he could invest in this thing. So I wanna see more women who have the financial ability to be able to do that through their sports. That's really exciting. And, and I think that investment is a game changer because what we're basically talking about is resources. So oh, totally. Is yeah. being poured into a, a men's game versus a women's game, and the ability to have all the pieces and parts. It's all about resources, which comes down to you know what you budget, and that is you know as as we look at issues related to race, um, you know the budget does matter when you when you see where investment is um, and where investment has left. Um, you know, we talked earlier, talking earlier about the CIA um, investment left, you know, um, or was, uh, you know, there was a time in which um, historically black colleges had robust investment. And, you know, when that left and when um, enrollment left uh, and uh, resources uh, suffered. Um, and so I, that is a big part of really driving towards equity is developing the resources, um, you know, to have. I, 
So. I think it's also making priorities. You know, the European Union has a, a new, a relatively new study out, and they decided first to look at the data of what their coverage was like, and then they saw that it was not good, probably around four percent, and they committed, you know, the guys on the top committed to changing that. And their goal was 50% and they discovered ways that that was gonna happen. And they required the people that were commentating to learn about it, to research and know what they were talking about when they got on TV. And it's that kind of priority that is essential. You know, it's not gonna, it's, it's not easy. I mean, one of the things that I've discovered doing the podcast is if I'm looking for information about an athlete that I'm interested in talking to, it's really hard because there's only 4% media coverage. And so I'm really having to dig in. So I understand that it's more work, but we have to be willing to do that. And the people on the top have to require it. I think, you know, as women, we need to be investing and purchasing tickets and attending um, you know, women's sports as well, that our voice is important, um, our commitments, um, that, you know, our involvement with our, our daughters, our granddaughters um, is so important, um, you know, in sports, uh, that at the collegiate level, we are, you know, demanding parity, that, that, that we are um, watchers and purchasers of the women's game ourselves. I think that is um, you know, a way for us to, you know, be strong advocates. We, you know, the YWCA, um, you know, we did our 21 day challenge. We had a week focused on sports. Mm -hmm. um, we did certainly uh, look at men in the men's game, but we also, you know, spent a lot of time, um, you know, diving into, you know, women and the women's game and um, issues uh, related to uh, transgendered athletes um, and uh, helping people to understand that, you know, we don't need to be afraid of transgendered, uh, you know, athletes. And I, you know, I think sports for young people, including transgender people, is hugely important. And this crazy myth that somehow, uh, you know, transgender people are going to circumvent, you know, to be able to win X, Y, Z is just, it's crazy. It's crazy town. It, it is crazy town. And you know, it just breaks my heart that these, the, the girls or people are being told, kids are being told that they can't do sports because something's wrong with them. And you know, we've seen this already. We've seen what that does to girls because for so many years, girls were told that they couldn't do sports or they couldn't do certain sports or they couldn't do sports in a certain way. You know, like, why are we trying to do that again? You know, and I think it's easy to forget to, over, you know, it's easy to overlook the long-term impact of participating in sports. You know, 94% of women in C-suite jobs are, had per, played in sports. I mean, that's just, just enormous number. And then there are all those sort of cliched things that you get from sports like leadership training and teamwork and building competence and, you know, experiencing failure and, you know, I don't want to see another group of people excluded from those benefits. I also think that it's really suspect that suddenly there's a lot of interest in protecting women sports. You know, like where were you when there wasn't, or, you know, where were you about financial stability or the lack of health care or legal care or, you know, the right coaching or the right equipment or, you know, all of that stuff? Why, what, like, why now? Why this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's such an important uh, conversation to be had. And, uh, you know, last week, um, our guest, Kara Gibbons, uh, one of her colleagues uh, used the phrase, you know, calling in. We really need to call folks into, into sports, into female sports, into women's sports, um, and, and elevate um, the, you know, just the parity at all levels, which is hugely important. You know, I don't think that um, we can end this conversation. Um, you know, I, what a great tournament it was this year for the NCAA women's tournament, even uh, with everything that happened. Um, and the tournament kind of started out where um, it, 
if I recall, wasn't there something about it's March Madness? It's men's basketball March Madness, and it was like, uh, the women's game was going on too. Yeah, I mean, I'm drawing a blank on exactly what was happening. Do you recall? I, my, my details are fuzzy, but this is part of that whole web that I was talking about. You know, it gets really complicated, but apparently the March Madness has been copyrighted for both men and women, but it isn't used for the women's side for some reason. And there, there's been a lot of discussion about it. You know, like the head of NCAA was quoted as saying, you know, like, I'll have to look into that. I don't recall or something. I mean, like, come on, I don't agree with that. But also, you know, like, again it has impact so the impact that it has was that the march madness logo was not on the women's courts that's right that's and so it looks really rinky dink it looks like mm -hmm. they're playing in high school or something yeah, whereas the men have all this hoopla and stuff and it goes to what you were talking about of the women's game not being as exciting or women's sports not being as exciting you know it just looks less exciting you know that there's a visual of it that it looks less exciting when in fact of course that's not not true. Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was an amazing uh, tournament this year. I just thought it was just awesome. And uh, yeah, it, it, it is, it has come, you know, the women's basketball has come a long way and yet it still is shocking to think about, you know, where we are with the 4%. Um, I just, it's hard to get past that. It is hard to get past that. Yeah. 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 So it's, also, I mean, we, we talked about politics and sports and how mm -hmm. women are speaking up. And one of the, the episodes that really stands out for me is with Shelma Jun, who was a rock climber. And she started Flash Foxy because uh, she was tired of being mansplained while she climbed. And so she started this Flash Foxy, which was originally just an Instagram account. You know, like, I'll just start this. I'll have a community. And it just absolutely blew up. And now she's like totally big. You know, she has a, you know, pre-COVID, she had weekend workshops that sold out in, you know, literally minutes. And she has a film production company and whatnot. But one of the things that she said on the podcast is that she was criticized for bringing politics into sports. And her response to that was, you know, yay for you that politics is not part of sports. But my reality of climbing is that it's political. You know, my every day of climbing is that climbing is political because there she's being mansplained and, and whatnot. And so I think that's, you know, we have to remember that for most female athletes, more, most athletes of color, you know, their every day is political. Their sports is political. You cannot separate the two. And so that's why they speak up. I think, you know, I think we forget that, you know, that maybe we think that you know, they're coming up with this thing that they want to talk about just be, because they want to sort of bring mm -hmm. something outside of it. But this is the every day. Yeah, yeah. I think about, um, you know, one thing that I, I really do appreciate is sort of the female athlete body, which I think early, sort of early on as it emerged um, was, was shocking for people yeah. to see um, and even, you know, as a young girl, I can remember sort of the messaging for me was, don't do too much of this because you'll get muscular. Don't do too much <laughs> of that. And, and um, it just wasn't desirable. And now here we are um, really understanding the female body and having a value on it and its athleticism, its muscle. Um, that has really evolved over time, and I, I love that. Yeah, you know, it was a big moment for me. I mean, a big moment for me when I was in my 20s, and I had been cycling for many years, and I was like, I looked down on my gigantic thighs, which always had been a pain in my rear end as a kid, like my thighs are so big, and I was suddenly like, this is what they're for. This is why I have these big legs, is to ride my bike, and I think that we don't tell kids that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's surprising to me that many of the athletes that I talk to share very similar moments, you know, mm -hmm. that they've had eating disorders, for example, and, and, you know, have that moment of like, no, I can't do that because my body has a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I, I think, you know, the, uh, you know, body acceptance for, for women in general has really come a long way. And that's just been an absolutely, you know, beautiful thing to see, particularly, I think, for uh, women of color. Um, we have just really moved out of this very narrow definition of beauty, which has, has often been very, very thin, yeah. white, um, sort of blonde, long hair, sort of just one single definition of beauty. Exactly. And sort of this multifaceted um, embrace of the female body. And I just, you know, I really want more of that. And I think sports really helps with that because, you know, I think you, it, it would be hard to do sports and not to get to that point where you think, okay, my body has a function, you know, and I have to eat and feed myself to do that thing the best that it can. And, you know, my big thighs do this thing or that person's big shoulders do that other thing. And it becomes much more about appreciating the, yeah, the function of it. I think about Serena Williams and, um, you know, she has been the subject of many, uh, uh, you know, her body in terms of ridicule, uh, particularly early on um, and, and really through, um, you know, a lot of her career. Uh, sort of made fun of, and of course the cat suit um, was just, uh, you know, again highlighted, uh, you know, to, to sports inability um, to sort of continue to keep pace. Um, but uh, she has been, I, I think, a, a, another key driver yeah. in, you know, female um, acceptance of her body, power, uh, femininity, and, you know, coming in a package that is, you know, uniquely Serena Williams, you right. know? And I love Venus's response to Naomi Osaka's uh, mental health topic. And she said, you know, I go into these press conferences, you know, like my solution to deal with this stuff when I go into the press conferences is I look around and I think I could beat all of you on the tennis court. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and we've had male athletes, um, obviously, that have had social anxiety. I think about Ricky Williams, um, and I, I, I just think that there is a is a different way, and I, I hope that there will be some conversation across all of professional sports and collegiate sports around um, being able to support and accommodate um, uh, individuals that may be struggling. Uh, with their mental health. We all have mental health and, uh, you know, accommodations are, are, are needed and they're granted in other areas of, of life. And I think this is just as right. absolutely um, important. You are an artist as well. So we haven't talked about the, about the art and we really sort of uh, connected when Cleveland was having its first um, sort of international uh, community-wide art um, scene with Front, um, which should be coming back. Uh, yep. uh, but you know, we were interested in supporting an artist, the YWCA, we wanted to be supportive and we wanted to think about um, you know, being a part of this community and, but really wanted to do something different. And that's how we, how we met you and came to support the Glenville work that you did. Um, but talk a little bit about your art and how that shows up um, and it has evolved in your life. Yeah, you know, I think the biggest recent revelation for me about my visual art came when I started doing the podcast. And, you know, the podcast is, is so much more didactic. You know, I'm very obviously talking about women in sport and equity. And it made me realize that all my art was about that as well. And, uh, you know, I, even the stuff that's sort of abstract is about taking up space and breaking out of barriers and um, yeah, just being big. And I think that's so important for women. And, you know, it was exciting for me through Front and through the project at Glenville to sort of realize that, that it all did come together and I couldn't escape the issues that were really important to me because they showed up regardless of what I was trying to do. 
What's the most surprising thing you learned about yourself during COVID? During COVID? Ooh. I think the most surprising thing, and it, it's probably from the outside not going to seem very surprising, but that it's really important for me to get outside every day. And, you know, I, I think I maybe separated training and sport from being outside. And during COVID, I realized it, it was not separate, that being outside, being in nature, finding the, the soothing qualities of that just was really important. And I, you know, Cleveland, we're very lucky. I mean, here we are in a city, but the lake is right there. And I find the lake just incredibly tranquil. And, you know, I was lucky to be able to swim in the lake. I live pretty close. And so that was really fun. But also all our metro parks. I mean, man, they do such a great job. And just being able to go out in the woods and experience that through the different seasons was incredible. What does training look like for you? What is, I mean, what does that, what does that regime look like for you at this season in your life? And what are you training for? That's a very good question. Not very much. I mean, I really, as I mentioned, I really like training. I actually started, I mean, this is a little secret. I started because when I was talking to some of my guests, I realized I was not really understanding why they competed. Even when I was competing, I wasn't super competitive. I didn't have that like doggy dog kind of mentality. And so I wanted to start competing now or more recently to sort of figure out what that was and why I was avoiding it and things like that. So that's why I started training because I don't like showing up on the start line, not prepared. So that's why it started. Uh, I'm racing this weekend actually in a duathlon, uh, run, bike, run, run. And I'm still not sure about competing, especially at my age. I mean, I'm fast for my age, but I'm not fast. <laughs> so that's something to come to terms with actually. But my training, you know, I get out pretty much every day, even on off day, I'll just go out and spin my bike for about a half an hour on other days. You know, as I said, I really like doing intervals. And so that can be, you know, intervals are really interesting because the term is just, you go hard and then you rest and you do that repetitively. And so I, I like to see, you know, the different kinds of intervals. So I'll do intervals that are long and not quite as hard on, and I'll do short intervals that are very hard. Um, mostly I ride and run, but uh, I do strength training. Strength training is so important for older people. You know, I heard the stat, I wish I could find the, the reference and I can't, but I heard a stat that you should be strength training the same percentage of your age. So if you're 50 years old, you should be doing 50% of your physical activities as strength training. I don't get anywhere near that, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a good reference for me to remind me that it's really important to remain strong especially as we age so that we can be functional. I love that. That's a great marker. I, you know, I hear you say, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it is about the competitiveness. Um, and yet I think to myself, how the heck do you win a gold medal at the Pan American Games if you're not got win, 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 win inside your core? I mean, nothing says to you, oh, I'll let her win today. You know, I mean, right. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little, I, I'm not you know, quite buying all of that. I am very competitive and I'm not going to argue with you, but you know okay. what I really like about sports is the trading aspect. I love that process of going out every day and, and, you know, nailing a really good workout and, you know, going hard and testing myself and again, seeing like, what can my body do? What, do, what, what kind of adjustments do I have to make if I'm feeling pain? Uh, how do I get faster each day? You know, all that stuff. I really, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I, and there are, I have heard other athletes who prefer training versus comp competing, but I tend to get very stressed out when I compete. So there's a level of like discomfort that I've, I'm trying to become more comfortable with. Well, I, you know, I have to say that I, part of what I love about sport for myself is just real, it's, it's sweating and seeing what my body can do and pushing myself and, um, and, and maintaining strength, you know, feeling strong and being strong. I really, I really love that. And, um, you know, I'm an uber, uber sports person, uh, love sports. 
um, that have really, um, you know, over the last 20 years or sort of, um, you, you kind of have to push away all of the biases around the, the women's game, yeah. which I think is an element of where sexuality and the women's game that we don't talk enough about, that there's a bias there literally linked to the sexuality um, of female athletes and this hovering suspicion over them. Um, and we'll have to talk about another time. Yes. Uh, I, I, the, I, I'm I'd really love to just hear your cliff notes on that. You know, I'm really interested in that because I think, again, this goes back to society's vision of what women should look like and how they should act and stuff. And I think that we're still sort of under this cloud of thinking that women can't be aggressive or if they're aggressive, I don't know if I could say this, but if they're aggressive, they're bitches. And that's the only way, you know, those two are, are linked. And when in fact, of course, they're not linked, you can be aggressive and not a bitch. And you know, we just, we do not as a society have an understanding of what female aggression, female competitiveness actually truly looks like. You know, we have visions of what male aggression looks like, and I don't think that translates necessarily to women. I agree. I agree. Well, it's been good to see you, my friend. I, we too. have not connected in a while, and I, we always talk sports when we're together. Yes. Um, so I'm looking forward to um, uh, cooking something up for uh, the uh, tournament coming in 2024 here at Cleveland. That's going to be exciting. I love that um, idea. We should I all want, go. Yes, yes. I want to encourage everybody to um, download or subscribe to um, Hear Her Sports podcast. Um, it is really insightful. It will uh, deepen your conversation. You'll be awed and wowed um, by all of the women um, that uh, Elizabeth has on. And it's just an amazing uh, podcast. And I encourage you all to, uh, to listen. So thank you, Elizabeth, for, for joining me today. And I will say goodbye. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's been so fun and great to see you. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.